Mondays with Mike Martinez. Hey guys, welcome back to Mondays with Mike. I am here with my very good friend, Angel Garcia. This guy is a freaking legend in the Valley. He's one of the top listing agents. We're going to talk about his story because he's no longer a listing agent. He is a hardcore entrepreneur and businessman. My favorite type of people. Angel, thank you so much, brother, for uh, rolling through to our headquarters and uh, podcasting it up. Let's talk about yourself a little bit, man. Uh, where'd you grow up? How'd you get into real estate? I'm in the San Fernando Valley. Um, I got into real estate because uh, my dad. Uh, my dad's been doing real estate for a long time. Um, he was a realtor, one of the biggest realtors in the area. So when I turned 18, I wanted to get into real estate, but uh, he actually didn't let me get into real estate. That actually made, wanted, that made me want to get into real estate more. <laughs> um, but anyways, I, I got a couple of jobs and then I, I jumped into real estate a about a year or so after, tried college, didn't like it very much, and then uh, um, started doing well right, right away. You didn't finish college? I thought you did. No. Oh, shit. All right. So I've known Angel for about three, going on four years now. We were in a mastermind together of uh, wholesalers that were, you know, just coming up together in the industry. We were selling the hedge funds pretty heavy. And um, this guy was considered of collective greatness. He was considered like the data genius very data driven. And, uh, when I found out that he was kind of a, um, a big deal in the, in the agent space, um, it was very interesting. Uh, can you talk about what year you went from being a listing agent into wholesaling? Yeah. 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 So, well, first thing is that I started off as a realtor, right? So as a realtor, my dad was already doing flips when I got into real estate. Um, but he was a real he was a top realtor before he started doing flips. Like it was like 08 and stuff. I got started in 2013. Um, it took me about three years or so to really start figuring out stuff on the investment side. I jumped into some flips and I actually started doing flips before I got into wholesale. And we were doing a lot of flips. What year was that? That was uh, 2016 to about 18, between 2016 and 2020. And then we started off with a few things. I started partnering with my dad um, so I can focus still doing uh, listings and stuff. Big luxury flip, so I remember that. There weren't even big luxuries, just that they're in California, so they, they're expensive. But yeah, we we start, we ramped up to a pretty sizable volume. We were doing a lot of like ADUs. We were, we were one of the first ones to really start doing ADUs the second that, that law went in place because uh, mm -hmm. we knew it was a big need in our area. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to focus on making sure that I was focused on my one thing, which was listing property and then gaining capital and then looking for deals, right? Because I would find, let's say, uh, listings, some of them were distressed. I would just convert them into a flip. But what ended up happening is that as we started to scale up, we ran out of like contractors and handyman and operations like manwef to be able to handle the flips. And then that's when I started to bleed into the wholesale side because I was like, I still want to make money from these deals. So we, we, I was already doing, I was doing well as a listing agent. We're doing over 100 deals a year as a, as a realtor. And then we started to ramp up the flip side. At peak, we would have about 25 to 28 flips at any given time. That was including primarily ADUs, but the but the whole time on them were pretty long. Yeah. That's why they were operational like nightmares. Um, but it would take like nine months on average to complete a project. But Imagine we, there were bigger properties too. They were good profits and it was right when the market was like doing really well. So they were nice, but they were a headache. Wholesale became like incredibly nice because you didn't have to do all of the work that you would need to do on the flip and you also had more territory to hit. So you can go nationwide. With that. I know that because I was there. Yeah. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> so I want to fast forward because uh, I don't want people to get the impression that this is a wholesaling party podcast. Um, we're just talking about Angel's background as an agent as a, an amazing wholesaler, um, part of our private mastermind that people wanted to be a part of and they couldn't get into. I want to add that. Uh, but Angel was really, really an inspiration in that mastermind to the team. It was about six of us, six different uh, members of six different companies, six to seven of us, um, including our wives. It was probably a team of about eight or nine people. But um, Angel was the very first one to pivot over into another industry which was solar. A couple of us also got into that industry. Sort of. 
because you, you had already come over from a different industry. I never left. I was still in the industry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so wholesaling for me was just, uh, it was kind of a side hustle. Uh, I seen that it was an opportunity to make a couple million dollars a year pretty easy. And, you know, at scale, now that I look back, you know, three three years later, we still wholesale. And uh, we do it very, very part-time-ish. Like Natalie spends maybe an hour to a day with her team. We have a phenomenal team, by the way. Shout out to 247 House Offers. Um, but it doesn't really have a lot of our attention anymore. But we were consistent doing a million dollars a year. But the point is that Angel was the first one to kind of explore other industries using some of the superpowers that we learned from wholesaling, marketing, and sales, I say this all the time, is the key to making your first million dollars. We were just talking about that before we started the show right now, and he agrees with me. So talk about how you pivoted into solar, and you still kept wholesaling. What did that look like? Well, so what happened is that the, what, what, I, what I realized is that the skills that we had that we built, and it was the same thing like in real estate. When I went over from the retail side and the flipping side, I realized that it took the same skills to build out the wholesale operation and I was making more money on the wholesale operation. So, well, at least uh, more than the retail side for sure, right? So the cool thing is, is that I was using the exact same skills. That everything I was already doing now is just making more money. So when I looked back at that, I was reflecting on it. I was like, hmm, I'm now in two different businesses in the same industry, right? The retail world and then the wholesale world. But they're both attached um, and tied to whatever happens in the market for that industry. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to essentially be, uh, to some extent, vertically integrated because the real business was sales and marketing. So the sales and marketing team that I had and the operations team and the systems and all that was exactly the same in solar. And I wanted to jump into an industry that not only had uh, a similar sales process, um, a similar way of generating leads, but I also wanted something that wasn't attached to what is inevitable. At some point, real estate's going to have maybe a down. I want to have something else that won't be affected by anything that would happen in the real estate space. So that was why I made the decision to just open up that business. The other thing too that I looked at when I was looking for another industry that would also kind of create this opportunity was I wanted something that would also have some sort of government backing. That makes sense. Do you still believe the same that solar won't be affected if the real estate industry is affected because solar is essentially tied to real estate it is but it's it's different it's like the way that it gets affected anything catastrophic can affect everything right like it can affect the entire economy um but it's not as tied to it right? like let's say for example the interest rates go up um in real estate it pretty much cripples most of the industry but when you do it in solar, it doesn't really cripple it very much, right? Like it can change the product that you're selling between, let's say, a, a loan versus, let's say, a lease system. But it's not tied the same. What may affect one sixty percent, right? Like the business can change by sixty percent as far as number of transactions that can happen. In the yes, we've seen that. Yeah, it, it'll make a ten percent, fifteen percent dip or change in the, let's say, the solar industry. That makes sense. I love the clarity because at first thought. I would think just as first thought, I would think that it's tied to it. But now that you explain that, even though it's related, it wouldn't have such an impact negatively if interest rates change. And that's really what everybody worries about in real estate. Yeah. Once interest changes, everything starts changing. Yeah. So it's crippling. Yeah. So what do you, what's your opinion on wholesaling versus solar? Like where do you make more money? What's a better industry? What's easier? What's some pros and cons? When it rains, it pours in real estate, right? Like it's very cyclical. And one of the things I, I knew about real estate is that every single year, I'm fucking rich during the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> and then in like November and December, deal flow starts to slow down. You may have closing. So yeah, you still get getting paid and stuff like that. But if you notice that like 90% of your income comes in between like March and September, right? In real estate. Second and third quarter. Yep. So there's two other you quarters. You taught me that. Yeah. So you can see it every single year. You can look at like any sort of sales stats and it goes up like that. Solar just has a little bit more of a transition. I like the idea of being able to stabilize a little bit more in different ways um, to have that consistency. 
So it, it was more of just like a balance act. I think both industries are great. Um, both industries have a lot of upside. It's timing on things as well, though. And with real estate, like right now, I think we're about to go through a glory period in real estate. So I think if I have to guess between the two, if I had to take like an like a, uh, I don't know, my opinion on something, I'm going to say real estate is probably going to be the next good one for the next few years for probably what could be obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get it. We just had an election. <clears throat> so the real estate president. Oh, yes. No, that's amazing. He's actually good friends with Grant Cardone. So, you know, uh, one thing that you did that was also very interesting is you launched a predictive dialer uh, company of software um, that was last year. Mm -hmm. So we actually use it in our real estate company. It's phenomenal. Um, thank you for that. I get huge support from his team. And uh, we use it in our real estate company for telemarketing, for cold calling. And um, that is one of the most essential tools that you can ever use when it comes to telemarketing, also known as cold calling, in a lot of industries, right? I use it in debt collections. We use it in real estate for wholesaling. You can even use it for um, like agents, telemarketing, soliciting leads. You can use it in solar, which is considered home services. Um, you can use it in a lot of different industries, even business to business if you set it up the right way. So him creating a software like that is very, very powerful and it's needed um, for sales and marketing to get to your first million dollars. I want to remind you guys. So talk to me about that. Like what sparked that idea to do that? So what I realized is that, uh, and I actually got this from you. So you're, you've always been really good about being a serial entrepreneur, right? Um, and I noticed that I was, and you probably remember this, I would say no to almost everything. Right? Like I say no to anything because I see it almost as a distraction. I'm just like, all right, I want to focus on this one thing and kind of just grow on this. I tried it out for a little bit and I said, okay, let me see if I can say yes to a couple of things more often of things that just may be there just to allow my mind to just get in this creativity zone. I knew that anything that I want to touch, I want it to be of very little effort, right? Or very little strain from the business. And it's only things that can support the business. So that's like being vertically integrated. So I was looking at something that needed a bunch of help and and was already a big part of my business, right? Cold calling is a huge part of my business, a huge part of your business, right? I need I knew that there was a problem that was getting worse and worse and worse. And if I didn't fix it, I could damn well be out of business, uh, at least for this marketing channel, right? Um, because cold calling was getting tougher and tougher and tougher. Calls weren't going through. Started to see a lot more calls uh, showing up as spam and it started affecting dollars, right? So I tackled down that problem internally for myself. And then it turned out to be a great solution to where it was something that I can share with other people. Um, All your friends use it. Yeah. And you have 125 collectors that use a predictive dialer system. Yeah. And it's difficult. Um, most of them will do 80% of what you wanted and needed to do. It's that 20% advantage that's missing that could really optimize any business, their their revenue opportunity. Yep. So like we, we, we love using the systems that, that you've created. Uh, so with, with this system, adding that portfolio to your book of businesses, it's a different, that it's a subscription business, right? Yeah, and that means that you have a uh, consistent amount, a consistent amount of, of revenue being generated every month. So this reminds me what you just explained right now really reminds me of what Brandon Dawson has taught me. He's taught us it at Cardone Ventures and 10X community that any business that you're going to integrate has to be vertically integrated. If not, don't do it. So an example is you're not going to open a car dealership and then go open a candy shop. Like those right. two <laughs> things have nothing to do with each other. Yeah. Right. He's used also businesses that are the same industry that are still not vertically integrated. I'm going to give you an example of what that means. Okay. And I've suffered from this. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So let's say that you're a dental practice and you're one of the top dentists in Phoenix, Arizona, but you like to go to Aspen every year. And you're like, Hey, it'd be a good idea to open an Aspen that is not vertically integrated. Yeah. Like you have no business opening an Aspen yeah. if your headquarters is in Phoenix. Now, what if you expand to Scottsdale? 
that would be vertically integrated. Or if you have another business that provides services to dental offices, and it's a service that you have to buy anyways for your business, that's exactly what you did. Right. Right. So I suffer from this. Uh, I was going to open a collection agency in Anaheim in Orange County. Well, I live in Ranch Cucamonga. My headquarters is in Ontario. I, I leased an office uh, about a year, year and a half ago, right next to um, the Angel Stadium. Like my office, you can see the Honda Center right across from my office. Very expensive. I furnished it and everything. And then I quickly found out, oh shit, I got to drive all the way to Orange County now. <laughs> I'm like, that's not vertically integrated. Yeah. I could have expanded to like Upland or Fontana or somewhere nearby Ranch, open another head. So that's, that's what, you know, vertically and non, not vertically integrated is. Yeah. It's like hassle-free basically. It doesn't, it doesn't strain the, the, the main business. Yeah. It might take a little bit of focus off of what else, whatever else you're doing, but if it's still integrated, yeah, it's, it's a good business. And that was the thing with my, with, with like the dialing system. I didn't build it for anything else other than to improve my, my existing business. It's the same thing. Like when you build out your, uh, your the solution that we were talking about right before we jumped on here, right? Mm-hmm. You're building a solution that's built for your business. Um, it just so happens that it may be able to help other businesses. Yeah. So our collection software. Yeah. Um, I bought our debt collection software, uh, from a buddy that I had met last year, um, who was the CEO of a collection agency that was doing $5 million a month. And I asked him, what was, you know, the biggest factor of your success? And he says, I'm always innovating technology. So right off the bat, he told me that that is his strong suit. So he built a collection software and I was struggling with my software at the time. It was garbage. It was taking us a long time to import files. And it was just, it, I just can't stop crying about it. So I bought it from him and I kept them on as a 3% partner to keep them on as an advisor, as a technology advisor. So I, he sold me the software cheaper and I kept them off on as a partner. I was already spending a lot of money on my software and it sucked. So this was a huge investment, but in the future, we're going to offer this debt collection software to all small and mid-sized businesses as a debt collection software for them to use in their business to recover their delinquent accounts receivables. So that is vertically integrated. I needed it anyways. Right. And, and our day-to-day operation, our collection agencies, we're optimizing it. We're always, you know, uh, taking it further for development. So that's perfect. Right. So let's get down to the juicy part. All right. You have three businesses. You have a real estate operation, which is retail and wholesale that you still operate. You have your solar company that you still operate. And now you have a software company with this predictive dialer to help telemarketing. <laughs> What is your revenue roughly this year between all companies so far? Our in goal, November. Our goal was to be uh, at six million. We're just a tad bit over five right now. I still want to say that we want to try to hit six million. You're gonna hit your target, bro. That's your target, and you're gonna hit it. Yeah, but I, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I, right, right now, being in a, you know honest and everything, I, I don't. I think we're probably gonna miss it, but we're we'll be pretty close. Oh. Um, we're not going to have that mind. We're going to have a 10X mindset around here and you're going to hit it because you're going to hit it. I'll tell you uh, one thing that will probably uh, make it a little bit tougher to hit is I'm, I'm leaving a vacation like in a few days and I'm going to be gone at the end of the year. So, Yeah, but you have a, you have a good team. Yeah, yeah, we, we have a good team. But and that's, and that's the most important part, right? Brandon teaches us that businesses don't make the people, the people make the business. So as long as you have the right people, you'll be all right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's one of the things that I've been working on. Like, uh, last time that I came over to your office when I saw before you moved into this place, that was one of the things I took away is that you, you knew how to manage and you knew how to like run an actual company, right? Like you, I knew how to run small teams, you know, how to run a company. And then I looked at it, I was like, man, you have your CEOs and you have like your CEOs and you have your, like someone that is in charge of it. And it's funny because like you've seen me, I'll go deep into certain things as almost like an integrator, right? I'll find something, I'll see something that is a problem. And my first reaction is, let me fix it. Your first reaction as a true entrepreneur um, and visionary is, who's, who's going to take care of that it? shit? Someone's, I gotta, someone's got to take care of this shit. Brandon says this. Yeah. You get to a certain point as a businessman yeah. where you become an owl. Who? Who? Yeah. Who's going to do this? 
who broke this? Yeah. Who's going to fix it? Yeah. And that's one of the things I took away. And I, and, and, you know, I still have all my notes from when I came out last time. I worked really hard when I went back to literally just focus on that. It's like, how do I continue delegating more things out to where I can start saying who? Like how as much, right? There's that book. And then there's also a, another really good book, Buy Back Your Time. It's one of those things where it's like, it, it's it's a true skill to make that your first reaction. So now that I've got better people in place, doing the amount of revenue that we're doing today is nowhere near as painful as it was for me to do a million dollars in revenue in retail. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that because that is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And that's called leadership. One thing that will, will cause you to not get frustrated and constantly being let down by your team is having really good communication, setting high expectations, but clear expectations, rewarding them when they meet those targets and expectations. So working closely, being patient with them, giving them all the tools, all the resources, all the guidance, providing them the knowledge that they need to get it done the way you wanted it done. I have a question for you. When did when when did it transition for you? Like what? Because you, or was it always right off the gate? Like you were always more of like who, not how. Or, or at what point did it all of a sudden become like, oh no, I need to find the person. That's a really good question. In twenty fourteen, at the end of twenty fourteen, me and my partner split. So I owned the collection agency from 2012 to 2014 with a partner. We split. I was honestly, I was doing all the work and I was getting really frustrated. I was the visionary and the integrator and we were doing, we we're doing okay. We we're doing about 200,000 average a month. Um, but I wanted more than that. I had, I had a bigger vision and he was really holding me back. So in 2015, I started my own company and we started off small. Uh, I wasn't doing the same revenue as I was doing with him, but I started scaling very quickly. Again, I was the visionary and the integrator. I was on the phones. I was doing admin work. Like I was doing everything. So I brought in my brother-in-law as an admin assistant. And now he's my director of administration. I'm developing him to be my, my possible CFO one day. Um, or at least my, you know, vice president of finance. So I brought him in as like my first admin assistant. And then about a year and a half later, I recruited a general manager that I used to work for at a law firm in collections that was working at another agency that was going down. So I just kept pressing him and pressing him, trying to recruit him, but I finally did. I knew he was a good manager. So I knew he had a lot of experience. I knew that he would help me grow the business. And I brought him in and I got spoiled within a, about a year. I got spoiled. I became an absentee owner. And he started developing managers and he was basically um, my chief operating officer. Now, now that I think back. So you found someone that was just really good that almost taught you to do it because he, he, didn't, teach, the he didn't teach me how to do it because he still required my vision. Well, what I mean he was, was a good integrator. What, what I'm saying is that like he, he taught you in the sense of like that it's possible that someone else can probably integrate and take care of things and get things off your hands yes. better than maybe you getting involved in it yes. yourself. So I became an absentee owner. I, I mean, we would have Christmas parties and my team would be like, who is this guy? We don't even, they didn't even know who I was. They thought he was the owner. <laughs> it, it didn't help too that, you know, he was white and he had, a, he was a super alpha. Like it didn't help. So they're like, who's this, you know, young Mexican dude? Like, no, I'm, I'm the owner of the business. <laughs> I would just show up to the Christmas parties. Uh, so the show people that, were, yeah, the old school people that were with me, they knew who I was, but all the new people, cause we were growing. Yeah. And I think that kind of like set me on a path to like, no, we were growing. Yeah. That set me on a path I guess without me even realizing it, I'm like, okay, I can grow the business without me always being here. Yeah. Because we did it. And we went from like 200,000 to at our peak, 600,000 a month in revenue. So how do you incentivize guys like that to join your organization? That's the problem is you have to pay them well. And I ended up overpaying him. And when I realized, but, but you didn't, when you, when you brought him in, he wasn't overpaid to start with, was he? No, but he was doing such a good job scaling that I kept throwing money at him. And when he would ask for more money, I would just give it to him. Yeah. So I was in a weak position because I was afraid of losing him. 
So what ended up happening is when I started training with Cardone Ventures, um, and even a little bit before that, I just put my foot down. and I'm like, look, dude, there's a lot of broken pieces. So my expenses keep growing and my revenue is not anymore. So we, we're already plateauing and you're the leader in charge right now. You're my general manager. I'm an absentee owner. You, you used to deliver results. You're not doing it anymore. All you're doing is increasing my expenses and you asking for a raise every five minutes is not helping. So I basically took, he was making a lot of money. When, when, when was this? Cause you said that was when you started. This was in, uh, this was, uh, I shared this with you guys. Yeah. I remember uh, you told me about this happening that there was like, it, it was almost like a, uh, a, a scary point or not a scary point, but, uh, you, you, you said something that stuck with me and it still sticks to me. I refuse to run my business out of fear. Out of fear or desperation. Or desperation, right? Or out of weakness. Sorry. Out of weakness. Out of weakness. Desperation. Yeah. Um, so, uh, this was right around the end of 2021, beginning of 2022. And that's really when I was in a very scary place. So I really submerged myself right around that time is when I started working with Brandon Dawson and Cardone Ventures. And I learned that it was leadership. It was leadership. So I was never, and you, you, I remember you asked me to come to my office to learn how I operate because you, you were impressed with my leadership. I realized that I didn't even know there was leadership. I didn't even know that there was leadership that I needed to learn. I, I was unintentional. So when I started working with Cardone Ventures, I became an intentional leader. And what that looked like was learning, number one, leadership, how to be a leader to other people, to myself and other people, how to run an operation of a, of a business organization, sales and marketing, finance. I had to learn business finance. I didn't go to business school. I had to learn that. People human resources and running teams, attracting, finding, attracting, developing, and retaining the right people. Like Jim Collins says in his books, getting the right people on the bus, getting the wrong people off the bus. I started learning that stuff and ultimately it made me stronger, but it was fucking scary. When you lose your general manager who runs a company for you and you're not involved, that's some scary shit. You have to tell the people, break the news to the people at the Christmas party that uh, that you're the actual owner. <laughs> some people left. Some people left. And uh, now, that, you know, I've, I've gotten calls where people have wanted to come back and we don't allow them to come back yeah. because they left when I really needed them. Yeah, I and I, I told them, I said, dude, this, this ship is not going down. Like now I, I haven't been a great leader and I, and I apologize, but now I'm here. Now I'm here and I'm going to make it up to you guys. All I'm asking for is for you to stick with me. And the, the core, a lot of the core, like the real loyal ones are still with me and they probably make, they, I know they do. They make more money than they ever have in the past sure. when he was here. So, um, dude, let me ask you, so what's your target for next year with your businesses? What's your plan? Where are you going? Where's Angel going next year? Well, my, so here, here's my uh, plan. I, I plan to build uh, the Enzo dialer up to something that we can sell. As far as like total revenues between all businesses, uh, the goal for next year would be eight million. Um, the, the, the idea though, and the bigger focus is being able to position the software, uh, to be able to start like basically position it to where we can actually start getting offers to actually sell it. That, that, that to me is the ultimate goal right now that's dude that is the trophy that's the championship ring of an entrepreneur yeah um it's like validation right it's like a it's real like it's real it's it wasn't like, an accident yeah it was it was real i built it and it's it's reality yeah um dude that's that's freaking that's amazing um before we go can you share with the audience what do you think has been like the most important things to get you to where you're at right now to five million to give you the confidence of going to 8 million as an, as a real businessman and real entrepreneur, like what attributed to that network, the network of people that, that I have around me. So like I, I realized, um, really early on that the better friends I would find would, they, they would challenge the way that I would think. Right. So if I get around certain people, I love being a sponge run them. Like in most rooms or most people that I'll talk to sometimes, right? Like if you're almost in any random room, you're usually going to have quite a bit of information at this current stage. But every time I get around you, it's, if you notice, I'm, I become a sponge around you. I'm not a sponge around everybody, but I am a sponge around you. Thank you. 
that is uh, uh, that that is basically like how it works at any stage, right? Because there's already there's always someone that's a few levels ahead that you can learn from, but you got to know when to become a sponge. So for me in retail, I looked for the people that were the big dogs, where I can learn something from them, and found ways to be able to either bring value to them, um, and or like just level up to catch up to be able to network with them. Yeah. Right? But a lot of it was being able to bring value to them. Like if you notice, even our mastermind group, the way that I got into that group was that I I did my absolute best to bring massive amounts of value. Exactly. I did every. I made it a point that I wanted to give more value to that group than where than, you were receiving than what I was receiving. Right. And I wanted to do it by tenfold. And I didn't want to be like I didn't want it to be like a debt game yeah. where it's like, hey, uh, you I owe me, I owe you, because yeah. I do this right. It's like no, I'm gonna put it all on the table. Anything I have, let me let me give, especially to the to to our network, right? Because those are the allies, of course. So those allies, it will come back around one way or another, as long as you're picking the right people. Yeah. So intentionally picking these allies, like yourself, um, I know that I can call you up. Your circle has a, a huge impact, and I'll be honest with you, me personally, I know it's probably gonna hurt some people's feelings, bro, but. I'm not able to to hang out in crowds anymore where there's negativity, um, or if if they're not talking about progress in business or family or health, fitness, whatever. I honestly don't even want to be around it. I don't want to waste my time, bro. My time is way too valuable. I realized from being around not just Brandon and Grant Cardone, not just these guys, but higher level individuals in the community. I've met people that are doing a hundred million dollars, and it's like nothing to them, and you get around those crowds and you listen to what they talk about, like no one's talking about nonsense. They respect every single second of their time. There is no time to bullshit. Like uh, I have a meeting right now. Um, Abel is the biggest Bell Bonds guy in San Diego. We did a podcast a few weeks ago and we're having dinner this, this evening. I'm driving to San Diego to have dinner with him because we're already planning on how we're going to do business together next year. And he thinks big. He thinks big. He's, he wants to expand. Shit, he wants to launch a fucking insurance company. Like, that's big, right? And he wants me to be part of it. So for me, that's very well worth my time, right? Going to drink with somebody or going to dinner with somebody that really is not doing anything big, it's just not worth my time. I can use that time for something else that's going to have an impact on my life next year or in the next 10 years. And um, getting around those those people and listening to the way they speak, listening to what they talk about is huge. And that's when I shut up. That's when I listen and, and I just like a sponge, dude. I just absorb. Yeah, I've seen you do it. I've seen you do it where you get around certain people and you, you, you turn into a sponge as well. I'm normally a talker. Yeah. I'm normally a talker, but around like, I see people at Cardone Ventures events and- there, let's say that it's an event that I've already attended, right? The, the 10X 360 is a perfect example of this. I attended this event almost two years ago. I went back a few weeks ago and I brought 10 of my managers with me. And when I go to these events like this, I've already been to the event. <laughs> I've learned not to ask stupid questions. So some of these guys come in and I don't mean to offend anybody, but it's just, I'm just being honest. I have to be transparent, it's a core value. <laughs> I hear some of these guys asking stupid questions and I'm like, dude, Brandon Dawson is about to shred this guy right now. <laughs> stupid ass question. I've learned to not even ask questions to Brandon in public because I don't want to risk that it's a yeah. dumb question Yeah, and him shred me in front of everybody. Yeah. So if, if I think it's a stupid question, I'll wait till I have a one-on-one -on -one call with him or something, yeah. you know? So some of these people have to just realize, are you asking a powerful, are you asking a good question? Yeah. A powerful question that you're going to get a powerful answer or is it a stupid ass question? Yeah. Uh, so just be conscious of who you're around. You know, that that's just my take on it at this point. So dude, next year, uh, I have no doubt that you're going to hit your 8 million. And um, what does your team look like right now? How big is your team? My team's actually pretty tight. Like right now, it's, it's probably the tightest that I've ever had it for how we're running. And it's because again, the same thing, the, Coming to your company, and and I and, and I'm not joking. I'm not just because we're on your uh, podcast here. 
uh, coming to your company taught me a lot. Um, I was, if you remember, very, very big on independent contractors for almost everything, right? Like I was getting 1099s, right? Yeah. Um, 1099s, you need more people to sometimes almost make the same impact, especially if you don't have like the right structure in place to create that that right model. I wanted less employees, but more product- more productivity. So I started hiring a lot more W-2 employees and created basically another layer, right? So like in the solar company, we created verification managers. In the um, uh, real estate side, we have the lead managers, which we weren't really using before. We would use lead managers, but we weren't using them very effectively. Um, in uh, the, uh, you know, and obviously in the dialing system, the subscription model, it's all W-2s. But it, it's it's that switch. I was almost afraid to do uh, W-2s before, and I would almost just lean towards saying, that was less risk, you know, and, you know, it's, I just rather give them a little piece. That model didn't uh, work out very, very It's not well. scalable. It's not scalable. I'm getting away from that model. I was just talking to um, one of my executives. I was doing his one-on-ones. Uh, one-on-ones for us is every two weeks, I have a one-on-one with them for 30 minutes to check the temperature, to coach them, to see how they're doing on their metrics. Are they doing their development? Are they reading the books that I assign them to read? To make sure that they're growing right and then i go over their personal professional financial goals and i was looking at his ppf goals on his one-on-one and one of it right there was you know he's really committed to the company he doesn't see himself going anywhere else he wants to help us grow and he wants to take a strong he's already a leader but he wants to take a very strong leadership in the organization's growth so one thing i mentioned to him and i said look um my intention for you is to eventually become my chief revenue officer for all my collection agencies. That's my intention. What that's gonna look like in the next few years is the 1099 model, we're, we're moving away from it. I literally had this conversation before you got here today. Yeah. And I said, dude, we're getting away from it. So what may happen in the future is my top 20% of 1099 contractors, I may offer them like a partnership model where I'll give them the same percentage but I'm not going to feed them calls anymore. Like right now we have you know, 85 people overseas feeding them calls. They can still use my software, but there'll be like a, there'll be small branches where we're just going to provide the debt, the software, the support. Um, but they're going to be like their own business. Right. Kind of like a branch unofficially. Yeah. Right. Um, but I, that's the only way I see it working. Like I can't manage them. I love the W2 plus uh, commission. Right, like that model to me is you, you get a different uh, amount of talent that comes in through the door as well. Different quality um, and then different standards, right? I love both, right? Like there's benefits to both, but that W-2 definitely is more scalable. And it also can create a lot more profit margin as well if you're looking at your business as a margin, if you're confident in the business, then the revenue that your business can bring in. So my team, to answer your question, is a lot smaller. We, I would say... The big majority of our team is almost all uh, uh, W-2 now. And right now we have a lot of overseas as well. We have 240 people overseas. And then the rest of our team internally is a total of maybe about 30 people. That's that's a very good squad. Yeah. That's a very good squad. So um, do you know what your revenue was last year for all your businesses? Um, no, but I can probably give you a pretty good ballpark range. Um, last year was a little bit interesting because we we had just jumped into the solar industry. Um, and then real estate was, we didn't do any flips. We had completely pulled out because I lost about 800 grand in 2020, towards the end of 2022, beginning of 2023. I remember you shared that. Yeah. So I lost a lot of money there. So I cooled it and pulled back a lot in real estate. Um, it was actually probably one of my worst years uh, last year. Um, that's where all the other stuff kind of came about as well. Um, if if I ballpark it, we would probably ride around about one to like one and a half ish. And I would say the majority came from solar. In a, in the amount that we put under contract though, we had a big wave that came in uh, for 2024 right off the bat because we started in 2023, the uh, like the solar company. That was pretty much when we initially launched it. But the revenue, as you saw, it takes forever to get paid out on it. And that became our primary income. So we had a gap of income for the first half of the year um, that was like spotty, like it wasn't, it just wasn't consistent. 
my respects, bro. So solar was was tough. Now, mind you, I had partners and we were kind of a mess. Um, I had to pull out of that business. I just couldn't sustain it anymore. So my respects to you because I know how hard solar is. Yeah. For everybody that's in solar, my respects to you guys. I tried it and it was fucking hard. It's it, it's it's definitely a tough business. Like I, I, it was one of those things where it's like I didn't want to pull back from it because we were already so uh, invested into it. Um, we were doing good, but it was just more of like getting paid out is the the hardest part in the solar industry. Like you just that's what broke us. Yeah, you can do you can do everything right on your end, but the people that you work with, like screw you over, like like you've never seen in any other industry. But that was a twenty twenty three was a as a kick in the nuts in comparison to let's say 2022, which was my, you know, uh, probably my biggest income year. Um, made more more uh, net income than I made this year. And that was uh, because we were doing a whole lot with the hedge funds. That's insane. Do you know what your revenue was in 2022? We did about five and a half between retail flips and wholesale. So that's important that, that people realize what happened here. So five and a half million, 2022. 2023, one and a half million, mm -hmm. which is insane. Yeah. And keep in mind, like my expenses were still high, right? So one and a half million sounds like, oh, boo hoo, right? No. One and a half million is one and a half million gross, right? I have expenses. I lost 800 grand, even though like, uh, like basically towards the end of 2022, rolling into 2023 between different like flip projects that were on and properties that I closed on because the hedge funds pulled out on a bunch of them. So I guess I still got some properties that I still haven't gotten rid of. Yeah, that's crazy, dude. Yeah, I, I have a few too that, but I, I mean, I just had a strategy meeting right now with Natalie, and um, what we're gonna do is next year, hopefully interest rates go down, we're either gonna refinance or dump because we did gain equity on some. Yeah, that that we were barely breaking even on rentals. Yeah, um, I kept a few rentals. Um, so five five million, five and a half million, twenty twenty two, one and a half. You know, last year you tanked. This year you're at five million again, right? Next year you're going to eight million. So what I'd like to do is check back in with you at the end of next year. Yeah, because we love victory stories here. Yeah. We love triumphs. We love winning. I, I I'll tell you. So like my goal is to do uh, uh, eight million for next year. I I, I feel very confident that we're gonna do. It. I feel like we're gonna blow past it. A lot of it because real estate, like solar, is uh, stabilized. Right, so that's good because now it that we had a lot of stuff that went on in the solar side that created issues. I think I mentioned a little bit about in, uh, before this, right, between lawsuits and all that stuff, right, um, and getting screwed over. So between that, it's stable now. Yeah, real estate is about a pickup, and then the dialers just warm it up. So oh, I I, I feel like eight is uh, being conservative. Good. Oh, dude, I'm freaking super proud of you. Um, 30% growth is, is really good. 40%, you're like, you're amazing. You know, I was frustrated. We grew 30% from 2022 to 2023. And then this year, I only grew 15%. So as long as uh, we don't have what Brandon calls a snapback or a slipback is, is what you experienced. You experienced... Um, you you actually experienced a um a, a, sla a s slip back okay so that's like there's breakpoints in a business mm -hmm. and we could talk about this you know at, at another time too offline but i always talk about this cuz i learned it from brandon so there's breakpoints in a business to get to your first million you got to figure out if there's a market for what you're selling and even if you don't have strong sales and marketing you should be able to get to like any idiot can create can generate a million dollars Sorry, guys, to tell you that, but it's true. Like any idiot that understands a little bit of sales and a little bit of marketing, you do a million dollars. So that's break point zero. Break point one is from one million to three million dollars. That's a break point. Okay. What you need at that break point is you need basic understandings of sales and marketing. Right. From three million to eight million is the second break point. Okay. That's where you're at right now. Well, I, I would argue that I'm almost still between uh, that first break point or break point zero almost, right? Not zero, uh, but one. basically per, on break yeah, one, right? Because per business. Because it's per business, yes. right? So I, I have different legs to stand on. So I like that because it feels a little bit more stable, right? Because it's not like it, not everything doesn't rely on one business or one person that operates that business, right? Um, it's 
it feels more stable, but they're all small, right? There's not one that's doing like 20 million, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so what you need to focus on, bro, like to get each business to the second break point, which is 3 million, right? Okay. So let's just say hypothetically, you have three businesses, you want to get all three of them past the first break point, okay? That'll put you past 3 million each business. That'll put you to $9 million. So if you focus on every business doing $3 million of annual revenue, as long as you, there's certain rules in business. As long as you maintain at least a 20 to 25% profit margin per business, you're good, okay? So what you need to focus on to get past that is you need, obviously sales and marketing has to be polished. Number two, you have to focus on role duplication. That's where SOPs come in and training, developing, and duplicating the important roles of the business, right? Once you get into breakpoint three, uh, which is, or breakpoint two, I'm sorry, which is between 3 million and 8 million, once you get to that point, okay, what you need at that point is you need some foundational leadership. You need to start building leaders. That'll get you past 8 million into breakpoint three. 8 million to 15 million. Okay. So I'm I, I'm actually in break point four right now. Right. I'm between 15 million and 45 million, 25 million. I'm sorry. 15 million and 25 million. That's where I'm at. I've been stuck here for like going on two years. So Brandon is helping me get past that, but I'm also building a new company. So by me building the new company up, it's causing me to stay stuck in this breakpoint longer than I'd like because my focus now has to go to my other company to getting it to, to catch my first agency of 20 million. So what I'm going to do in the next two years is I'm going to focus on getting my new agency to catch my big agency and I'm going to marry them. And I'm going to have like a 40, $60 million company overnight. Right. That's a revenue company. So that's not the valuation of it. It's actually uh, it's gonna be a, lot more. yeah, it's a lot more than that, right? Like what? 200 million probably? Probably with the software and everything. I'm, I'm shooting for 250 million. Yeah. That's my target. Yeah, yeah. So that's one thing that's important to to recognize is that you're not you're not talking about the value of the business. You're talking about just annual revenue. Those yeah. Two different things. Yeah, valuations are conversations we're going to have in the next two years. Yeah. We're not there yet, right? We got to yeah. learn how to walk. Uh, learn how to crawl before you learn how to walk. Learn how to walk before you learn how to run. Yeah. So, um, yeah, dude, like I said, I'm super excited. Uh, to see you hit your targets and your goals. I mean, 8 million, let's shoot for 9 million. You know let's what I mean? Let's shoot for 9 million. Let's shoot for 9 million, bro. You got three companies, 3 million a piece. Like, come on. Yeah. Let's get past. I got to get the break point uh, two. Break one. point two. Past one. Past one, I got to get a break point two in each business. That's the goal. So it's 1 million to 3 million. That's break point one. 3 million to 8 million is break point two. 3 million to 15 million is break point three. 15 million to 25 million is break point three. So I gotta get to number two on each business. At least. Yeah. At least. So dude, again, thanks for coming through, bro. I appreciate you. I'm here for you, whatever I can do to support you, bro. Just all you gotta do is ask and I got you. Thank you for letting me interview. For sure, man. <laughs> Enzo Dyler, uh, where can they follow you, Angel? Uh, Angel Garcia, CEO on Instagram. Um, <laughs> Angel Garcia. <laughs> Angel Garcia CEO on Instagram. Um, I guess I got to do a YouTube channel too. So, yeah, we got it. We got to check them out. So, guys, listen. I hope that you took away serious value. Inspiration is one of our core values, and Angel has personally been a huge inspiration to me. I respect him so much uh, as a businessman, as a friend, as a as a person. And make sure you guys go follow him. And I'll see you guys next time. Make sure you like, subscribe. I'll see you next time. Mondays with Mike. Let's get it. Appreciate it, bro.